hardly a topic for laughing at. G'day, folks. Welcome to today's show, another episode of the Seriously Funny Podcast. Today, we have a brilliant guest, a man I've known for 38 years now. That's right, 38 years. He's an absolute legend in the underground Australian punk scene, although they're not even that underground anymore, as they've sold nearly 250,000 records over the years, and I think they even went on the Arias or something like that in Australia. They're still going strong today. They've toured the world. They've played with famous people all around the world, and they've just been requested to go on tour with The Damned from the UK, another legendary punk band. So please, welcome to the show, the one and only, the legendary bass player from the Hard-Ons, Mr. Ray Arn. G'day, Steve. G'day, How's Ray. Going? How are you? I'm going well. I've got sleep. Yeah. Oh, how did that happen? <laughs> I went to bed, <laughs> which Those doesn't damn. always mean I get sleep. But... Uh, oh. We did the we did the other podcast the other day with Thomas from Ireland, and I had about four and a half hours sleep. I, you know, I I wake up, and sometimes my brain just goes, "We're not going back to sleep," and then I just lay there. And I'm staying with a friend of mine at the moment, so I'm in a single bed, and I'm six foot three in a single bed, just going. And then I just lay there, and then I get up, and then I'm just absolutely exhausted. So I went to my friend's house in Balmain last night, and uh, he's got a massive couch, and I slept on there, and I actually fell asleep and didn't wake up for eight hours. So now so, I feel excellent. So you actually got sleep then. So what did what did you do? Put on a little river band record or something? <laughs> God, <laughs> the little river band. Yeah. Hang on. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. You don't need sleeping pills, folks. Just put on the little <laughs> river band. Just grab your tits. Box set. I'll tell you what I do find funny is when you get these videos on YouTube that go, how to fall asleep in under two minutes, and then the meditation goes for three hours. <laughs> well, well, that's not very confident, is it? This, this should go for two minutes and 30 seconds. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. I've got that backwards. <laughs> yeah, yeah, instead I'm laying there for two and a half hours. Uh, oh, man, uh, that, that's as silly as... um. Uh, you know, losing weight with hypnosis. <laughs> so, so, uh, you know, this this bloke goes, um, yeah, I've been teaching people how to uh, lose weight. I I, I put uh, I hypnotize them, and wake them up in three three weeks. <laughs> I go, well, of course they're going to lose weight. <laughs> anyway, what are we going to talk Sorry. about? It? No, that's all right. Well, obviously, what we're going to talk about today is your musical history. Okay. And as we were talking the other day when we were talking on the phone, uh, you said you have no problems talking, which is wonderful because that's what you've got to do. Yeah, I'm the spokesman uh, for, for the hard-on, so uh, I, I do uh, most of the talking. <laughs> good, 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 good. Well, for, for, for people who are internationally, who, well, I know you're known internationally. You've got a bit of a flash there. That's okay. We'll run with that. We'll run with that. I've got. I don't really have questions because we've known each other for so long. But I've got a few a few points. I guess you could just go through the history of the band. I know that it was formed in 1982. Yeah. Um, well, we we um, knew each other. Me, Cash, and Blackie. We knew each other from primary school in 1975. That's when we all met in 1975. That's when I started um, school in uh, Australia. So, Cash and Blackie were. Uh, some of the earliest um, people that I met when I moved to uh, Australia. So that that's how long I've known those two guys. And, um, of course, uh, we went to high school together. And um, in 1977, this punk thing happened. So all of a sudden we were interested in um, punk music on top of all the hard rock stuff uh, that was around. Um, I mean, I don't have to tell you, Steve. I mean, if you're growing up in Australia in um, in the mid to late seventies, um, heavy music was kind of prevalent. Um, bands like ACDC, you know, were really popular, um, and of course, the pub rock scene was um, yeah, big very prevalent. Yeah, like you like you walk past um, pubs and there'd be like lots and lots of street posters and whatnot, always advertising somebody playing um, in the suburbs too, mind you. Um, so we were surrounded by all that. And um, 
uh, as you would know, Steve, because we're obviously similar age. And well, the, um, the, the only thing is, sorry to interrupt, is I grew up in the Blue Mountains, so I oh I saw none of that. Oh, okay. That we grew up in um, Punch the Lakem, yeah, Punch Bowl, Lakemba, Wiley Park area, and um, the local pub there was Wiley Park Hotel, and also down the road was Punch Bowl Sundowner Hotel, where a lot of bands used to play. So we were surrounded by pub rock, and um, uh, they in 1979. I remember Cash and Blackie talking about forming a band and stuff like that. And the following year, 1980, I I saw them in the school playground. Um, surrounded by other people, and I went over to investigate. And um, Blackie was, uh, you know, right in the middle of the throng with a, a portable cassette player, and uh, he was playing his own band that he had with um, uh, Cash. And it it's kind of it sounded punky, sounded some of it sounded bluesy, some of it was like um, like um, boogie, like a lot of. Australian hard rock bands had that boogie. Remember, bam, 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 bam. bam. So ACDC had that a lot. Oh, totally. So yeah, yeah. obviously they were really influenced by things like um, ACDC and Angels, and um, you know, almost every second song sounded like um, Gene Journey by David Bowie. You know that um, lurching boogie rhythm. Yeah. And uh, but the guitar was really obviously savage. You know, like he was like playing guitar and stuff, and and I thought it was fantastic. And I, I thought, oh, I need to form my own band too. And um, there was a school band called the Straight Jackets. Um, they got their name from uh, the song Straight Jacket from the Angels um, uh, album there. And uh, they were playing around uh, the school hall and uh, parties and whatnot. And, and I saw them and and I, I just fell in love with um, watching them play, you know. And... Um, I, I try to form my own band, but um, uh, I had this idea that I was going to be a lead guitar player and stuff like that. Um, probably because I love Kiss so much, and um, um, my favorite guitar player was Ace Frehley. And um, uh, at the time, I had a similar head shape to Ace Frehley as well, you know, oval. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I, I, I just really loved uh, his guitar playing, and I thought I was going to play lead guitar and. And then it, I, I just realized that around that area, the Lakemba Punch Bowl and uh, uh, Wiley Park area where all our friends were living, everyone was playing lead guitar and nobody was playing bass. So I um, I got some money off my mum and dad and I w ran to the local guitar shop and bought a bass guitar. And uh, as soon as I did that, I rang Blackie and I said, hey, Blackie, I bought a bass. And he said, oh, did you? I go, yep. And um, I thought, I'll just let that uh, hit them for a while. And because uh, I had this bass player named Peter Bransgrove, and we're all really close mates. But Peter was the, uh, I remember Blackie having a bit of a moan about him. And uh, it was basically uh, about musical ideas. Like Blackie was into things like Public Image Limited, The Ramones, The Damned, uh, The Stooges, that kind of punk carry on. Uh, the Cure, you know, um, things yeah, like yeah. that. Uh, new Wave stuff, magazine. Um, Gary Newman was popular around at that time as mm -hmm. well. And um, Peter Bransgrove was into Ted Nugent, Van Halen, um, which we admittedly we loved. Um, Deep Purple, uh, Janis Joplin, that kind of carry on, which we thought was from another era. and. Um, uh, there was a group of us that wanted to explore, you know, what they would call uh, post-punk and new wave. And uh, Peter was like, like his feet were, were like deeply entrenched in the old guard, as it were. I mean, we all love Deep Purple and Led Zeppelin and things like that. But uh, it just felt like um, when you're like 14, uh, you, you just don't think about going into your like your mum's garage and uh, coming out were coming up with uh cashmere you know uh, yeah, it yeah, just yeah. seems too it just seems too um far-fetched and too uh technical and um uh we didn't seem to be like teenage virtuosos or anything we just seemed like like a bunch of kids that want to play music and if you hear the ramones for example you think well i think i can give that a go it doesn't seem that uh involved um although you know i mean 
without um, uh, disrespecting the power and the simplicity of that music, which is you know very very impressive, um, we just thought um, we could give it a go, and uh, that because of that reason. Peter Bransgrove didn't really fit in. I mean, he was turning up to band practice with a uh, a, a leather a band around his head and uh, bell bottoms, you know, and everyone else is wearing straight legs because they're into punk and they had short hair. Um, so um, Blackie basically more or less said, I want you to join. And I said, what about Peter? And Blackie said, well, we, we're going to ask him to leave and you, you can replace him. And, I, and, and immediately we were different. Like Peter would play his... Fender precision, like up here, you know, with his fingers, like that's very no, technically correct. <clears throat> that's no good. No, not for a punk band, right? No, no, good and if you're in, mean, yeah. it's all right if you're in Toto, you know. But that's exactly right. Or you know, anything else other than punk. If you're if you're a punk bass player, yeah. then you play with a pick and you play quite below the waist, and that's what I used to do. Um, and uh, I didn't really know how to play bass. I, I I knew how to play some chords on the guitar and stuff like that, but. I didn't know how to play bass, but um, uh, w within two weeks, we had enough of uh, a set to play um, a party. It was one of Kesha's um, relatives um, having a birthday party, and so we were guaranteed a feed after the show. That was our payment, and we played in um, Kesha's parents' uh, lounge room, and the room, it was sold out. It was full of, like, uh, you know, a room full of Sri Lankans. And um, <laughs> we played a Buzzcocks cover, a Ramones cover. We played a Dead Kennedys cover, if I'm um, correct. Uh, and th that was 1982 by the time I joined the band. Um, and, uh, oh, yeah, the, the, you know, like a lounge room of uh, Sri Lankans just exploded after we finished. And we got mobbed. So I was getting mobbed by Sri Lankan um, people uh um, and why I remember Kesha's uncle grabbing and saying, your, your band's going to be huge. And I, <laughs> I said, it's your first gig at, at somebody's party. How would you know? And he said, no, no, you're going to be big. And um, I, um, I guess, sorry to interrupt, but I guess to explain to people listening, wondering why, why Sri Lankans? Because Kesh, obviously the original drummer was Sri Lankan. Yeah, yeah. So we played it. <laughs> it's a not just. Family party. Oh, we we did a gig in a, in, in, for for the Sri Lankans. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's, it's nothing, nothing like that. Yeah, <laughs> but <laughs> although although uh, we looked into um, touring um, the subcontinent uh, about thirty years ago, and, and that went nowhere. It was too hard. Um, but yeah, that, that's how we started, and then from that moment on, we just tried to play every school party. Um, uh, or a dance party we could until uh and we're sneaking into a lot of pubs to watch bands to get you know still ideas from other bands and whatnot and um uh it, it's something that uh, it's it's almost like a rite of passage right steve i mean when you're young and you grew up in the suburbs you sneak into a pub right steve no oh, totally yeah so we used to do that um, and then oh. we were sneaking into pubs that had music and we just learned a lot from watching these um, adults play um, and we just couldn't wait to play so um, the youngest one of us was Blackie so when he turned 18 that just as soon as he turned 18 we played our first pub gig uh, more or less that's it that's that's well it's funny you, you we that's what I used to love about the old days in the underground you know especially well I guess anywhere but it's been in Australia you was it was it was so underground, wasn't it? Like, like there was, there was, there was this nothing, right? You just had to make it up. Our first gig, the same thing. We, we, we were in the Blue Mountains. I was lucky enough to know Mick Burke at school, met him, and then we found Tony Knoll, the singer from Slaughter Lord, and then, but we knew we knew two other guys, these guitarists who just lived close to us, like a five minute walk. It was shredders, like because we were into metal, right? Like, couldn't believe it how we managed to pull a band together in the Blue Mountains, and then we just found blokes in Blacktown where we went and saw Def Leppard and Motorhead at Selena's. And that's how Blacktown and the Blue Mountains emerge, and then we all start. Then we all just our our first practices were in the in the local hall. You know, it's just a just a. Uh, I can still remember on the wooden floor, and we had to get the we had to so the drum kit would move, so you had to put it on a blanket. Then we had to put the the piano. There was a piano in there. We'd get the chair from the piano and get one of our mates to sit on the chair in front of the bass drum. <laughs> so the drum <laughs> right. Right. And then our first gig, our first gig was. Also at a bloke's house in Blacktown in the backyard, we, we got his ping pong table and, and 
took the legs off it and put that down, put the drum kit on it. Then we did we did our first, we did Metallica covers and Slayer covers in this guy's backyard in Blacktown. Hey, Steve, have you heard of sandbags? Did you? <laughs> we didn't have sandbags. We just had a bloke sit on the bed. That's, <laughs> that's fantastic, yeah. Oh, look, uh, anyone who doesn't feel nostalgic about their childhood mustn't have had a good childhood, uh, you know. Uh, I think most of my friends, including yourself, would have had, growing up in that uh, era, would have pretty good uh, uh, memories because um, uh, we're at an age where um, we did a lot of growing up before the internet and stuff, so a lot of it was hidden from us and we were hidden from them, right? We didn't have bags of information at our fingertips to yeah. tell us what to do i mean you know there's no youtube so you can't watch other punk bands do their stuff so for us it was like well we didn't even know what bands that we liked uh used to look like on stage until we get glimpses very luckily here and there yeah, um yeah. so so in a way um uh but, I but think it, that's fuel, it I... fueled your imagination though didn't it, it was it was great because it was just oh it's yeah, and imagination is more important than knowledge, I guess. I mean, uh, I remember people uh, from Europe when I would travel to Europe with a heart on, asking about heavy bands from Australia, and you know, invariably the names like Slaughter Lord will come up. Um, Mortal Sin, of course, had the uh, opportunity to tour Europe um, with you playing drums, obviously. So there were. Um, there was more knowledge about Mortal Sin because, yeah. you know, that band was physically there. But with Slaughter Lord that played uh, for, a, you know, burnt brightly for a short time, how would they know? I mean... I'll, I'll uh, tell you how they know because because I was so into the underground fanzines. Right. So I tape traded. So, so, so Mortal Sin were less known in the underground before Slaughter Lord. Yes. Because right? I used to do the tape trading, going all the, all the fanzines. So that's how I – because in those days I was writing to Bathory and, yeah, yeah. and the guys from Creator, and so we got thanked yeah. on their albums because because I did all the tape trading and all the fanzines because that was so funny because in one sense Australia being so isolated, we, if we'd sent a demo to Kerrang, they would have thrown it in the bin. Right. But once that once the people started making like metal fanzines, like the punk fanzines, then I could send the tape to everywhere, Brazil, Sweden, America, Canada, and people actually did articles on you. Yeah. So, but, you know, so the yeah. underground, the, that tape trading scene opened up Australia to the actual world instead of just having to send it to Kerrang or Metal Hammer or something, you know. Yeah, but that that's – so Slaughter Lord was mid to late 80s, but, um, uh, I mean, I'm talking like 85, 86, you know. So that's a – that's very – that's in, in a lot of people's eyes – that's a lot of that's early days of um really fast heavy music i mean it's oh, way it's before total, it's the beginning of the fast well heavy yeah music. that's right so it's way before say for example those florida bands like deaf and stuff like that it's way before that yeah. um and it's way before even bands like testament you know so um so how did you get this heavy sound and, and make it sound like that in isolation it's because you you guys had i guess it was fueled by your own, you know, get up and go in imagination and in a similar way to what the hard-ons did, you know? Exactly, um, exactly, man. Yeah, you kind of had to kind of backing your own gut feeling on on this thing, you know? <laughs> and, I, and a lot of it, it was. And a lot of it had to do with measuring your own speed, measuring your own volume, measuring your own heaviness and going, right, that's not enough, and take it up a notch to this. When you're completely, you know, heavy bands and fast bands were always competing with themselves to get, heavier on the next demo and what 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 not and you know a guy that i used to tape trade with back in the day was a guy named uh katon from a bank called hyrax hyrax and uh yeah and they what, what, he was one of the first black guys you ever saw in heavy metal bands oh yeah and, and his voice was uh, um, amazing i remember like i i only heard one thing on a tape and then uh we wrote to each other and he told me that his favorite band was the ramones and i thought Wait a minute! You sing in a really um, traditional heavy metal um, s screaming s and high pitched style. And I thought that's really unusual. And then I heard heard their album when it came out, and it's like 
this double kick thrash metal with really high pitched singing on it. And I thought, what, it was, wasn't their first geez, album called fantastic. Raging Violence? Yeah, yes, yes, that's yeah. right. Ra- Raging Violence. And then I think the next one was had the word and in it. It was uh, something and something. And it was really short. The first one was short. The second one was even shorter. The first one was the one with the that um, face that face on it with all those. You look like an egg in a <laughs> nest or something. But the yeah. egg had a big grimacing face on it. I think it was yeah. a pus head uh, artwork. And oh right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And and um, I thought he was coming to Australia with DRI um, recently, but um, I think they were double booked, so they never ended up um, 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 like getting here. And I remember like after they um, they broke up. Uh, Katon started uh, another band with uh, that guy Ron from. Well, he was the first bass player in Metallica, I think. Ron McGovernick. Oh, right, um, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so he they, he formed the band with them. So he was from that uh, West Coast uh, heavy scene, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I I used to trade tapes for a lot of different people. Also, um, a couple of other metal people that I used to trade tapes with. Um, I used to trade things records with um the drummer from the sperm burst for quite a, a long time traded records with um uh um the bass player from um cal from um heresy from the uk as well yeah. oh, okay he's yeah. from yeah he's from the nottingham birmingham yeah yeah, uh, yeah. really Growing really core. heavy oh my god they some of the best heaviest bands in the world and and uh you know the first time we played birmingham um Hummingbird. I remember meeting a uh, uh, a Shane from Napalm Death. There, he came to the show, and uh, we played with them um, uh, with Napalm Death at uh, Hellfest uh, in 2018. And um, their their uh, dressing room uh, next to our dressing room was Rose Tattoo, the other Australian band, and next to them was uh, Napalm Death. So I thought I. Uh, if I walk past the dressing room, I'd, I'd, I'd say hello to all of them. And I saw Shane, and I said, "Hello, Shane. I hadn't seen you for a while." He goes, "Yeah, the last time I saw you was uh, Birmingham Hummingbird." And then he said, "I said, yeah." And he said, "That was uh, 1988." I said, "Yeah, 1988." And I said, "That makes it 30 years ago." And then he just went, "Oh, holy moly, 30 years ago." <laughs> So, and, so and, oh, it's just nuts. So, so nuts. when did you did so? Because when did you first play overseas with the hard ons? Because I remember I always used to envy the hard ons because because I used to go, they get to go overseas. How do they go? Because we were just guys on the dole in the western suburbs, and I, we had no money, no support. And I remember thinking, how do you, I always used to go? They they get to go overseas. These guys, how oh. how, do, how do they do it? I, I tell you, Steve, I I, I reckon we we're, uh, you know, there there was like we were quite. Um, uh, blessed that we were able to go in 1987 um we signed a record deal in the uk with a label called um uh um vinyl solution and they they had a few different bands on there but um bowl Thrower was the other band that was on oh, there yeah. and um so we we're label mates with this band bowl thrower um, and uh, they asked us to come over so, and tour and, and promote our records and whatnot. And 1987, I was still studying. I was at university, and I was like, uh, I, I said to the rest of the hard-ons and Tim Pittman, our manager, I said, look, um, i got to get this degree, you know. I went straight from uh, – I was in year 10 uh, in high school when I joined the hard-ons, and I was the whole of, you know, high school, I was studying my butt off, uh, playing in the hard ones, and then the four years of university, I was studying really hard as hard as, hard as I could, you know, um, to get this degree. And I said, "Look, just let me get this degree. I can't go overseas in '87. It's, uh, it's uh, it'll kill me. You know, I, I, it'll kill me to uh, uh, defer to come back and try and finish off the d- degree later because once I start touring." Um, that's it. I don't want to ever study again. I want, this is all I want to do, you know? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, 88 came along and I, and, um, I finished all my lessons. All, all they had to do was send me the degree in, in a tube, you know? So, uh, my mum and dad were a little bit upset that, um, 
I didn't get to wear a gown and stuff like that, but I had to go to see the registrar at Sydney University to um, graduate in what they call in absentia, which is um, uh, they send you your degree in a in a mailing tube, and um, I was I was uh, on on a plane, you know, going to uh, going to Europe, and um, uh, so we were finally able to go. They the the band kindly waited for me to. Uh, uh, I finished the degree, and it was mainly because our record label was over there. Um, we, we like we were lucky uh, that you know, a bit like uh, underground metal punk um, had a lot of um, correspondence between the fans through fanzines yeah. and whatnot, you know. And um, I remember um, I was talking to a guy named uh, Digby. Digby was um, Digby, Digby Pearson from uh, yes uh, from Earache Earache so yeah so uh, he was really good friends with Brett from Mass Appeal yeah and right. Brett Brett from Mass Appeal told me that um, Digby was like really interested in Australian heavy music and um, uh, we had a we were releasing a record called Smell My Finger which we had <laughs> it always was, made um, me laugh yeah so we ha- I had the tape of it. But it was quite schizophrenic because half of it's just power pop, like it sounds like the Ramones or something or the Buzzcocks. And the other half is has like some double kick and it's a bit more thrash metal, you know. And so Digby got the tape and he said, look, um, I'd like to release it on my label. And this is, you know, Earache had just started and um, he'd released uh, Martha Splatterhead by the accused and things like that, you know. So, uh, and I uh, I told the other guys, I said, Digby wants to release it, but here's a catch, right? He only wants to release the four heavy songs. He doesn't <laughs> want to release the four pop songs. I was about to and, say, I want side B, not side A. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So, we're, like, we, we were, like, really, um, like, we we're really uh, heartbroken about it because, I mean, like, we we loved heavy music, but I think, at the time, we really believed that our the shtick for our band was that we 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 play pop music as well as heavy stuff, and um, uh, so yeah, we 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 didn't want to do it because of that reason, you know. Um, but uh, we we saw Digby when we got there. Uh, he came to the show in Nottingham, and um, yeah, and that night we stayed with Cal from uh, Heresy because we'd we'd been yeah. um, we've been writing to each other through um you know like a tape trading scene and that kind of stuff so um yeah but the first gig we did in uh london was in a small pub called the Serge george roby and then that went really well and we booked another uh, gig down the road a month later at a place called um uh, fulham greyhound and the support band happened to be two thrash metal bands one was um cerebral fix uh, yeah. The other band was the uh, Bolt Thrower, you know, and it was just wall to wall people. It was uh, they, it was oversold, and it was really good. And when we finished that gig, uh, it, it, it made me realize um, it's not such a big world; it's a small world. You know, we we've come all the way to uh, the UK to play, and the and the crowds exactly the same. That's what we felt anyway. O- Aussie crowds and uh, uh, English crowds and European crowds, they, everyone ended, you know. It, it all ended up being just the same thing, just but you know, one plane trip <laughs> Crowd, away. Crowds were fun then. They oh, really there. fun, weren't, weren't they? Remember those gigs? Those, so obviously, uh, we're getting ahead. So, you've got overseas in '88, but of course, so we played with you. I've even got a flyer here. So, we would have because Slaughter Lord was only what '86 to early '87, right? And so, so how many when did you start gigging in pubs and around? Because the scene back then it was like. When did we look? We got the, we got the hard ons and Slaughter Lord here at the St James Tavern. That was a great gig, Steve. That was a, that was a heavy gig, wasn't it? it. Yeah, I loved <laughs> yeah. it. I that was loved a heavy it. Yeah. gig. Yeah, that wasn't as heavy as when you played with Massive Appendage at um, uh, 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 Max's Peter Shemin. That is the most unbelievable gig I've ever been to. That is <laughs> that, that was the, that, that was the oh hottest gig in the world, wasn't it? Yeah, well, you, you, I think I saw you pass out, either yeah. pass out or vomit or something. No, I, I think Mortal Sin played that too. Yes, yes, you're right. They did yeah, too. Mortal Sin. Was it might have been massive? And was Death Mission on? Yes, Death Mission. Yes. It was you're so right. hot. Remember the, uh, the bar staff were getting the, 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 the garbage oh. bins of water and just throwing them full of water over the crowd. 
that was the first night. All the drummers had to go out after every four songs and just and just take a breath. That was the first night we were going to do Sodom, uh, Blasphemer, a cover of Sodom off the first Sodom album. And I just was it's fast all the way through. And I was just it was so hot. I went, I just can't make it. <laughs> is that is that is that off? Uh, that's off uh, in the sign of evil. Yeah, it's off in the sign. Oh, of evil. I, I love Tom Angel Ripper's haircut on the back of that. Record. I love it. I, I love it's, it. It's a great. It's the greatest thing I'd ever seen. It's somewhere along the line. You know his mum's got a pudding bowl somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's the greatest. It looks so freaky and weird, did not it? Yeah, somebody in Germany told me why that was, was because Germany's got uh, compulsory um, oh, uh, conscriptions for the military, and Tom apparently had been in the military, and he was waiting for his hair to grow out, <laughs> so he grew out. In the... <laughs> That's fantastic. I, but it I looked know, fantastic. Yeah, it was great. And then he had the makeup around his the makeup eyes makeup and well. the upside down cross and the... Yeah, yeah, but but that is like, but from the forehead up is Mo from the Three Stooges. You know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it looked evil somehow. It looked so, it looked oh. so weird and full on. Yeah, it's a, that's a strange record, Steve. It's uh, I love it. it I well, it's my it, favorite it, Sodom album. Well, yeah, it's easily the best one, but it's recorded so muddy, and then you just go, how come some of the greatest heavy, heavy, heavy metal records sound so great? underproduced and uh without the shine um it's a complete um opposite of some of the other fads that was around at the time of um you know how the other end of the heavy metal spectrum was glam rock and hair metal and stuff like that yeah, yeah. and if you listen to the first rat album that sounds like a billion bucks right yeah, yeah i mean yeah. it's a great album but it sounds like a billion bucks and then you listen to um <laughs> morbid tales and it's like I, I think they did that in a in the bathroom, you know. But it sounds so great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Well, you know, the it's two... funny talk, talking about you know, like bands like Rat and all that. See, and and when going back to when you were saying like, you know, you replace that bass player because he was a bit, he's got his bell bottoms and he was kind of into what you saw as old. That's exactly what happened to me. Like I was into traditional metal, right? Like like you know, I was getting into the the Priest and the Maiden and all that, and I and I loved it. I still love it to this day. But when Thrash turned up. That was almost like that stuff disappeared for me. Right, right, right. right. So, so it became it's that I used to separate the albums. Right. So, so, so Metallica and Anthrax and Slayer and Celtic Frost and Merciful Fate they didn't go next to Judas Priest and Iron Maiden. That I it's that same thing. I it was it was a it was this your time had now been formed. Right, right. I, I remember Henry Rollins said the same thing once. He was into Led Zeppelin and like in, in, when he was young and Journey or whatever and bits of hard rock, and then he heard the Ramones and the the, the Stooges or something like this, and he just went. <laughs> and yeah, and, well, and he, yeah, he just separated. And speaking of Rollins, you played with Rollins, didn't you, in the early hard on stuff? Yeah, we played a festival together in New York called uh, CMJ Music Festival, and. Um, we played one night and they were playing in a bigger venue the next night. So we went and saw them and uh, the band was uh, pretty much incredible live. So our manager, Tim, uh, ran backstage after the show and cornered Henry and said, I, I want to bring your live act to uh, Australia. And they came out in 1989, the following year. And uh, in I think in we 19, went to that. Was, yeah. that. was that at Paddington Town Hall? Oh yeah, that was a great gig. A yeah, great that was gig, fun. Right? Yeah, <laughs> I, I think I think I saw Slaughter Lord at Paddington Town. Hall. Paddington Town Hall is the first. Yeah, sure, Slaughter Lord. I think I've got the. Uh, oh, here we do. Now this is the second one. The first Slaughter Lord gig was with the old lineup with Sandy Vidani, who was in Sad X eventually, right. and our original singer when we were a five piece, and that was with. Ah, uh, the first one we we played with the two traditional metal bands, Axe Attack and Lotus. I was at. Axe Attack, yeah. And I we, op that. we opened. Yeah. And then Axe yeah. Attack and Lotus came on, but by the time they came on, about 500 people had left. I remember Axe Attack. Thrash was spawning. Yeah. You know? Yeah, they had that. They were kind of like, they looked looked like a, bit, a cross between a Wasp and Striper and Yeah, they, 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 liked, like, they, liked, yeah. they liked a bit of Kiss, you could tell. You know? yeah, 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 well, just a little. And then, yeah. That, and then the I second one, the second Slaughter gig yeah. was at Paddington Town Hall again, but that's when we got rid of the original singer, got Tony to play bass, and that was with, that's that gig. That's with yeah. Mass that's Appeal right. Morals yeah. and Slaughter Lord. Yeah. So, yeah. Because so, that was another great, and my mate made this. This is an old, this is an old flyer, folks, from the days oh. when 
Mortal Sin, the hard-ons, and Mass Appeal played together, and my buddy I'm staying with at the moment turned the flyer into a shirt. And this was Ben Brown stuff, wasn't it? Yeah, Ben Brown. Yeah, he he, he was Australia's pusshead. That's you know, exactly yeah. What I was about to say he's the pusshead yeah. of Australia. For yeah. people that don't know who pusshead is, he's the artist who used to do all the early Metallica skulls and the skateboard looking stuff yeah. with that. You know, the the famous one is that Metallica skull with the two clubs through it. You know, that's the famous yeah. pusshead yeah. one I know. Um, and so all these times, and when so when did Hardons first start gigging in like like the the punk scene when you started meeting like because who was around then mass appeal cosmic uh uh was it cosmic psychos, psychos? yeah no <laughs> our first gig was uh 1984 uh oh, in right, july right. yeah that was our first gig and um we were one of those bands that was lucky enough to play not just punk gigs we we played with a lot of punk bands around the time like um uh, Mass Appeal wasn't even around back then. Yeah, right. So we were playing with bands like Fisher Circle, Permanent Damage, Joyful uh, Killing, like pretty um, pretty heavy bands. Um, yeah, I remember Fisher and, Circle. Yeah. Uh, they they were all really good heavy bands, but we also would play with um, bands like Crime in the City Solution, which is like Roland S. Howard from um, uh, The Birthday Party was in that oh, band. Oh, right, we, right. Yeah, we played with the Recory, we played with the Saints. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, we played with a lineup of the Saints. It was Ed and somebody. Uh, it wasn't Ed. Ed wasn't in the band. It was Chris and someone else. And we'd play with bands like the Celibate Rifles, Lime yeah. Spiders. Um, we'd play with the Wet Taxis. We'd play with we play with a lot of bands that were around at the time that were clearly not punk, you know. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So we're, we're lucky enough to play with a lot of different kind of bands because at the time uh, we weren't strictly um, sticking to one style. We were very – I thought we sounded a lot like the Ramones and, 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 and a band like that sounds a bit like the Ramones with a lot of speed but also melody um, – you, you get to play with a lot of different bands. And we, we we wanted to play with everyone that offered us a gig. We never said no to anything. And he yeah, kind of yeah. that kind of attitude um got us playing um, you know, four times a week, three times a week, and that was really great. And then when Mass Appeal formed, um, they were our friends. We gave them our we, we gave them their first gigs and stuff. We became really good friends with them. Uh well, we're already really good friends. We knew them before they were Mass Appeal. And when they formed and we thought they were a great, great pioneering, heavy, fast band. And, um, you know, we met um, Wayne Campbell from um, uh, Mortal Sin when we were recording our Smell My Finger record. They were, were in um, 301 Studio D. Oh, okay. In, yeah, they were in three, Studio 301 A with John Darwish. Their with sound John guy. Darwish, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we became friends with John as well. So we ended up doing stuff with John as well. He ended up doing a couple of records with us. But that I remember uh, uh, seeing Wayne at the studio and he had, um, uh, do you remember that record by Onslaught called The Force, one with a pentagram on with it? With a pentagram on it. Well, yeah. it's funny you say that because the, their first record, Power From Hell, I remember that. Oh, the black album with, the, black the, with album. the devil with the devil coming off the program. <coughs> yeah, well, yep. Sla Slaughter Lord was called Onslaught before yeah. Slaughter Lord, right? So when that record yeah. came out, that's what made us go. Oh, now we have to change our name. Yeah, right. Yeah, we'd that actually we'd actually got the name Onslaught from the from the third track on the first Metal Church album, Merciless Onslaught. The uh, right, right, the instrumental. Yeah. So we stole yeah. that. And then, and then there was a good name on slot. Then we were like, "Oh crap!" And then we then we yeah. couldn't think of a good name. Yeah, and, and we were called Devastator for a while, right? And I was just, yeah. like, and I was like, "It's so shit." Yeah, it's yeah. so shit. And then you know who I think came up with Slaughter Lord? I think it was Rock from Sadistic Execution. Right. Okay. Yeah. We were just throwing names around like Slaughter, or that'd be a good thing. It might have been a Party Pig, and someone just went like, "Oh, Slaughter Lord." And I just, went, Fuck. there we go. It is a very catchy name, Jeez. That's a great, that's a great that's name. Great name. Yeah. yeah, it's great name. Better than yeah. Devastator. Do you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I saw, yeah, so Wayne said, yeah, we're in Studio A. Come and have a listen. So he, we went in, like, we went in there. We met, um, I think we met Andy there as well. And and um, is, that, is that is that how Mortal Sin and the Hard Ones started? To, is that how it started to cross over? Uh, no, that was that was how I met Wayne. You know, right, that's how okay. I met Wayne Campbell. So the first guy out of Mortal Sin that I was friends with was um, uh, Wayne Campbell, and yeah. the first guy that I was friends with from Slaughter Law was Tony Knoll. Just because 
um, I think Tony used to live at Utopia Records and pay rent there. You know, <laughs> every time I'd go there, every time I'd go there, he was there. You know, it's like um, so. It'll always be Tony Noll leaning with his arms folded against uh, the Metallica section there. Yeah. <laughs> and so we we talk and and uh, about music and stuff, and it was obvious, you know, Tony was a an extremely affable, likable kind of a guy, you know. Yeah, yeah, totally. And that's it. He was the first guy I met in uh, Slaughter Lord. But um, uh, when, when when were those first? Metal sort of Mortal Sin, Slaughter Lord Hard Ons gigs. It would have been 80, 86, all this stuff would have. You would have been, yeah, you know what? Yeah. I reckon it was, you would have been, uh, you would have been 86 for sure. Yeah. Yeah. 86, Cause, um, yeah. Because yeah, our, our respective records hadn't come out then, I don't think, you know. Yeah. And, yeah. And they came out in 86, at, at, yeah. towards the end of 86. Towards the end of 86, Mortal Sins, um, 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 Mayhem uh, Destruction yeah. came out. Uh, with that incredible cover, and the Hard On's first album, Smell My Finger, came out, and they were recorded on the same same week, you know, in the same studio. Oh, right. They, I, I never had, knew that. Yeah, how'd you get into 301? That's, that was 2,000 well, bucks a day back then. I know, but they, this is the thing, right? Um, John Darwish apparently was uh, reasonable friends with Mortal Sin, so he got studio a for them that was a really good studio with a piano in it yeah um at a discounted price and for us um we tagged along with a guy named um, tony espy uh who had produced our first ep uh surfing on my face so he had produced that for us um in 1985 the year before so um uh he started becoming the um, in-house engineer at 301, the expensive studio. So he he said, look, um, I can get you in and um, get you a, a, a discounted rate and stuff like that. And oh, that's, um, that's killer. And that's yeah, funny because then John Darwish, the last two Slaughter Lord songs ever recorded with that lineup were in that studio as well with John Darwish. Studio. Yeah. Well, and geez, then uh, that's how – and yeah. then to, to, to go on to that's how I met Lachlan Mitchell – who recorded mm. all the Presto stuff. Yeah. But the demos we did in there, which who, of course, is now the guy who records the hard arms records. Oh, yeah. There's, there, <laughs> there, it, it's it's, it's a quite a tight web, um, yeah. uh, Steve, <laughs> because as you know, Lachlan played um, um, piano and keyboards in uh, Nazul uh, with, at one stage, you playing drums, and then another stage, uh, Peter Costic Cost playing drums, who was also in the hard ons, you know. So yeah. it, it's um, <laughs> it's a tight little web there we've got. Uh, and then I, and then I tried out for the hard ons one day in about nineteen eighty seven at party. Yeah, and, and but yeah, and the only I thing, could never do that fast cash ride stuff. I was like, yeah, oh, that, the only thing this this was the only thing. Um, yeah, I couldn't uh, do that. This, yeah, that was, and I and and I think we we told you we said um, when when you go to the hi hat. It has to be tight and chaka 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 chaka, yeah. and that was something you're like. But everything else was great because the the kick drum was loud and which was very propulsive, and that's what we really liked about your drumming. The yeah. kick drum was, uh, yeah, that one and the three was like, bang, you know, we really liked that, and that's something that was one of the things that Kesh didn't have was a really hard loud kick, but he seemed to concentrate a lot of energy on the hi-hat and we, we got used to that because uh, the propulsion well, for the propulsion for the, um, suits, yeah. it suits the pop punch yeah stars, yeah you know, that's it's, right it's like, yeah yeah i couldn't do but that you know, it's no good yeah but you know i mean you know i come, um, I come from metal world i couldn't play i know punk. i know <laughs> yeah yeah i remember um when kesh was living with um wayne campbell at um Hassel Street in Parramatta. What a name, uh, Hassel Street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, we went to pick him up in our Tarage to to go to Melbourne, and um, uh, we were driving away, and Wayne and um, I think Pete McManus was there too, and there was a whole bunch of metal guys hanging out at the time. They were waving us goodbye as we are uh, going to turn and go towards uh, Hume Highway to um, uh, go to Melbourne. Um, so we're driving away. As we're driving away, uh, we all of us stuck our heads and arms out the window, waving to um, Wayne and his metal friends, "Bye bye, metalheads!" <laughs> and uh, and, and uh, Wayne Campbell, Wayne Campbell waved back and said, 
Bye bye punk metal hybrids. <laughs> so funny. It is a tight. Uh, it's funny you say yeah. Wayne McManus and Pete. Uh, uh, sorry, Wayne Campbell and Pete McManus. Who's this shirt is Pete McManus's. Yeah, yeah. Pete. <laughs> I'm, yeah. In, I'm in Pete McManus's house now. In fact, folks, look at this. He's even got this thing. How how ancient's this? Oh man, that's uh, that was eighty one. Uh, ninety one. Yeah. There we, yeah. Oh, there, we yeah. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I remember, got... I, I remember going to a heavy metal party in Blacktown and Pete was there. Uh, <laughs> he opened the door. I knocked on the door to go to the party. Pete opened the door and it was a fancy dress party and he had makeup on there and he was um, uh, dressed like King Diamond. <laughs> and he opened the door. Like, <laughs> <laughs> they were good parties back then. And I said, Gene wants his makeup back. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was heaps of fun. Yeah. So anyway, this is this is so much fun. This is going back. So so, and and this is funny. Going back to Tim Pittman, your your manager, who I ended up being in Presto, who's Tim Pittman's brother was our singer. I know he's got he's got uh, vastly got different two, people. Yeah. yeah, he's got two brothers. He's got two brothers. One of them used to put up, put us up at his house in uh, London, and the other one is, of course, Luke, who's um, a few years younger than um, yeah, Tim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The three of them are very different to each other. Man. You know, I love all three of them. You know. Yeah. When I found yeah. out that the, he was Tim Pittman's brother, I'm like, you couldn't be any different. I was like, you know. No, no. T Tim's Tim's not. Um, anything like luke um luke yeah. is uh yeah 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 and and you'd have to kind of meet both of them to um understand the difference um you couldn't really explain in words no, why they're no, so different no. but you know tim's a lot more serious and guarded in a lot of ways unless you get to know him he's harder to get to know oh, but you know so. he's yeah. yeah obviously he's still one of my best friends and luke's still one of my best friends and luke is um He's one of those guys that's uh, as soon as you meet him, he's very open and starts talking to you about uh, anything as long as it's Neil Young. <laughs> He'll start talking to you. About <laughs> <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> yeah. Well, he's a very he's a very talented guy, and he's the first guy like because you know trying to find singers and trying to find band members in Sydney was hard back then. You know, me and Aaron, we jumped on a bus. Aaron, who was the bass player in uh, Presto, and he was a Freak. He was a talented guy. I met him when he was like 13. He was playing in that death metal band Mortuary. And yeah, he'd, yeah. And he'd, he'd wag Very school talented. and come down and do these gigs, and he's on stage in makeup with a bass with spikes going, yeah. and he's like 13. And I just went, who is this guy? Right? And then yeah. I said to him, Look, when you, I said, when you finish, and he used to write to me when I was in Slaughter Lord, and then I said, when you finish school, just ring me and we'll make a band. And he and he did. He finished and he rang me and he was like 16. I finished. Yeah. Oh, we make a band. I went, all right. Great. <laughs> yeah, he, he he's he he was um a very talented bass player. I I, I remember his bass playing really well. Yeah. He was, but he was also quite 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 an odd fellow. You know, uh, I remember like um he he's he was that good at he knew where the notes were because I remember I saw Presto play uh at the Phoenician Club yeah. and um well he snapped the a string and it was an E string, the one that everyone snaps when they're going to snap a bass string. So he snaps the E string and you guys are still playing and the drums aren't stopping. Uh, so the, the band's still playing. So what does he do? He transposes all the notes from the E string up. So he's the world's fastest one string player now. He's like going up and down, <laughs> but, he's, but he nailed every single one. Yeah. yeah. And there's this songs had a lot of notes. Yeah. So, and not on top of that, it had, uh, 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 it wasn't straight rhythm. There was syncopation, and there was like, you know, there there was jumpy rhythms and stuff. So, but he was nailing everything. I just after the gig, I remember saying, "Too bad about your string." And he said, "Yeah, it didn't bother me that much." I go, "Well, yeah, I saw that <laughs> talented so and so. I thought that was well, really good." I used but to. Then, I used to call him the guy that had his left brain and right hemispheres both equally working. He could write poetry yeah. and write songs and play bass, and then he could form businesses. He was like, it was, it was like both sides of his head were just on fire all the time. You know? Oh, yeah, maybe too much on fire. But, yeah, yeah. You know, but, <laughs> yeah. but weird thing was, um, I remember him um, talking to Blackie um, after the gig, and um, 
And um, Blackie told me that him and Aaron were talking about equipment and Aaron had um, decided that he wanted to wire his bass. So he'd be playing bass and during the bass playing, he'd, he'd wire it. So he'd go, wah, wah, wah. And so Blackie goes, look, I've got a spare um, cry babies. You know, it's the, yeah. basically one of the best um, and most used um, Wawa uh, units out there. But it's for guitar, Steve, you know. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> but he, he sold his spare one to Aaron. And Aaron rang him within a week and told him he blew up his amp. And I said, oh, you're using it for bass. <laughs> yeah, it'll do that. <laughs> you're not supposed to do that. So, um, well, well, getting back, that's how we met Luke. Me and Aaron jumped on a bus. We went all the way to Melbourne to put up. So this is how we got to find a singer because we wanted a singer, singer, you know, not just. Oh. And then we, uh, we went to Melbourne on the bus, called, you know, t t 10, 12 hours on the bus. To put to put flyers up, ads for bands in studios or record shops and stuff like this. Got on the bus, came all the way back, went in the went in the next day and went into Red Eye. I was going to put things up in Red Eye and Utopia and all this, and then found an ad: singer, guitarist wants to join band. Luke, ring this number, and I just ring it off and went home and said, "Ring after five. And I got home; it was three, and I couldn't wait. So I just rang at three, and he was home, and I ended up speaking to him for two hours, and then bang, he was in the band for the next five years, and then. Again, oh yeah, I'm Don Tim Pittman's brother. <laughs> it's such a small scene, isn't it? Do you remember that demo you guys made? Um, that I I wrote the all the words for it on the cassette. That was my writing. That was my handwriting. Was it the? Uh, is it is it is it to find yourself one or the Amaja Gecko? I think he had a man with really big ears on the front cover. Ah, oh, that's. I don't know if I've got a copy of it here. No, it's in the car. That's yeah. That's the first EP. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's got that guy with the big ears on it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, hang um, on. Yeah. Hang on. I think I do have it here. Yeah. I think I'm I pretty sure that, that yeah. I, uh, that yeah, one. Luke. Yeah. yeah, I think Luke actually liked my handwriting, so that, I think uh, that's my go. handwriting there. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, I think that's my handwriting. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, there you go. Far See, around. folks. Such a small scene. Yep. Yeah. And so these days, as we come out, what, what, what have we been going for, an hour or so now? Oh, we've got plenty of time then. So what, 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 are, what are you doing these days? I hear you're about to go into the studio, and you're playing with the damned soon this uh, in Australia, as yeah. requested by the damned, which is cool. Oh, yeah. Um, every time they come out, um, they – Blackie – um, emails the guitar player captain because he's a friend of ours and uh, sometimes he replies sometimes he doesn't and this time he actually replied and he said yeah yeah i'll get you on all the shows so is that, we is ended that, up is that captain sensible yeah yeah he produced one of our records i was gonna so... say didn't he produce one of your records yeah yes he did and he's he was fantastic to work with fantastic because um when we were growing up uh, the damned were one of our um blueprint bands that you steal ideas from you know um so i would think that in your case slaughter lord there will be a handful of bands that you just go right that's that's fan that sounds fantastic so you 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 would have your influences and yeah. there's there'd be certain bands you go right this band influenced us and for us the hard-ons um yeah our big influence was um you know besides the ramones the damned you know they, they'd be like one of the biggest influences so i, I um, love i love that guy's voice oh uh dave the, the vampire the vampire yeah. guy incredible yeah incredible yeah. great voice huge fan you know uh i remember cornering him and um the first time i met him i said hi um um i said um i said to captain i went backstage and i said captain can i go and talk to uh dave your lead singer and he said Oh, 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 the vampire. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> so, and I, and I, and I cornered him. I said, uh, listen, um, I need to tell you something. And I, uh, for the next half an hour, I reckon I told him how much I loved the damned and his voice. And, uh, I said, oh, I guess you hear that from everyone. And he said, yes, but not, not with so much, um, uh, eloquence. So you did really well, young man. And he looked off. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, I love that guy. I was never a big punk fan. I tried to get into it. wasn't mm -hmm. my 
I bought I bought Discharge, Hear Nothing, See Nothing, Say Nothing, because it was because I think James Hetfield had the shirt on. Yeah, yeah. And I don't really only like Protest and Survive because it was kind of chuggy, that that song, which Anthrax did a cover of, I think. Yeah, yeah. But what I did yeah. love about that record was every song only had four lines in the vocals, and they were all the same line. Yeah. Basically. Basically. Yeah. Misinterpretation oh, of the human race, set on course, protest and survive, protest and survive. I think that's about it. Right? I think there's two more uh, yeah. different lines. And then my other favourite punk is The Accused, what you mentioned, Martha Splatterhead. That was a good one. Fantastic record, Steve. Fantastic, fantastic record. Yeah. And, and the first DRI album, Dealing With It. Oh, that's 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 actually that's official. Yeah, look, uh, that, that's that's an amazing record. That it's amazing. is amazing. Uh, Oh, it's a it's a touchstone record if you like fast thrash hardcore, you know. It's a it's really is. Um Martha Splatterhead record, I mean sounds it's quite lo fi, but it's yeah. absolutely blistering. Yeah. It's unbelievable. The, it's like the, filthy. What I love about those early discharge records that you were just talking about is that the vocals are so minimalistic that it just becomes another instrument, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's unbelievable. And I read um, an interview, I don't think, I think maybe Blackie wrote an interview and, and told me that they got, um, and it wasn't with um, Discharge, it was with somebody else related to Discharge because Discharge officially never gave interviews. Um, it, the lead singer, uh, Calvin, yeah. Um, got a uh, lot of the lyrics from uh, the the pol um, the protesters that used to walk around London handing uh, handbills out about um, nuclear war and um, um, and and uh, totalitarianism and that kind of stuff. So he used to just read it, read it out uh, <laughs> verbatim, word for word, and that, yeah, they excellent. became the lyrics. Yeah, look, uh, yeah, I look, I, I got to hear Steve. I'm a I'm a massive Discharge fan. Uh, I think they influenced um, what we know as they they were the fork in the row for punk and metal heavy oh, big heavy time. music. Big time. Uh, just ridiculous, yeah, filthy, filthy, just like, and growing core probably. Oh, totally. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. Well, there's there's a there's a bunch of bands that you you just go right. That's the beginning of something. You yeah, you yeah. listen to Motorhead's Overkill and that drumming, and you go. Oh, that's starting something. You'd listen to Restless and Wild album by I was about to say, Fast as a that? Shark. Fast as a Shark. Oh my there you God. Go. That's a that's that's a that's a seismic record right there, you know. Um you know, there's there's a whole bunch of records that you, you just go far out. They're starting something really heavy and unique and it's it's unbelievable, you know. I mean it's, the first time I heard Restless and Wild by Accept, I just thought what mate? It so was funny. unbelievable. Steve Brown, who played in Massive Appendage, the drums, he showed me that record. Yeah, right. Couldn't believe it when I heard Fastest Shit. No one could. Did you just hear that? Especially with that German singing at the start, with the do ba do ba do ba do ba do 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 do. You know, and then yeah, the, and then the yeah. record scratching. <laughs> Whoop! <laughs> ah! yeah. Oh, that is. You know how how like um. <clears throat> Some bands put laughing on their records, you know, like um, there's like laughing. It's, you know, the Damned had a song called uh, um, These Hands and, you know, the lead singer sings uh, and, and halfway through he starts, um, towards the end he starts laughing. You know, laughing in music, um, you know, it's underrated and that's it's one of the greatest mocking laughs <laughs> ever. You know, just Udo laughing, yeah, ah, and then, then the music starts. I mean, that then, lead guitar. Mate, the best, the best, the best laughing in, in metal is King Diamond. Oh, yeah, it's incredible. Yeah, <laughs> he laughs like he sings, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and you know who else laughs very well? Uh, Eric Adams on "Hail to England" on "Bridge of Death." Oh my God! Yeah, don't get me started on Eric. Jeez, he, he's... I've been listening to that track, "The Oath." You know, off a, a sign of the hammer. Yeah, yeah. Burning oh embers of the second death will come in the night. <laughs> this is the greatest in metal Man. song ever. When, when, when we were recording the demoing for "Smell My Finger," which was our second album, there's a song on it that <laughs> I wrote. Makes me laugh. Yeah, we, we, there's a song on it. There was a song on that uh, "Smell My Finger" record called um, uh, "Food," and I wrote that. And I, I brought I brought that to um, 
So I brought that to uh, rehearsal, and then it goes like this. They're the chords for the the chorus, and and then the melody is totally different, but they're the chords. But it's exactly the same chords as um, Animal, the second song on side one of Side of the Hammer. Yeah, it goes. Up to G. But Man will go. I'll just go. Stay on the D. So. Well, that thought, guy, that guy was in the Dictators. Was that another band you liked? The guitarist, Ross the Boss. Oh, yeah, I. The only way I got into Manowar uh, was because of Ross. And I, I, love I his, yeah, love his guitaring. It's so raw. I, it's just, it's just so unhinged, right? Just, but, oh, street level filth. Great. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, I remember um, when I met Ross the Boss. He was here in Sydney. Uh, playing with uh, the dictators in 2002 and he told me that he had a website because oh you should visit it okay i will and i said roster well i think it was like www.rosterboss.com or something like that and i went there and the first thing you see on his uh, page is like uh the only effects i need are my hands <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his hands on that. and because he didn't use um so he didn't use pedals. Yeah, so it's similar right. to uh, Angus Young. Yeah. So he's got um, he's got all the hand his hands uh, switches when he does a lead. He'll swap the pickup to yeah, to get right, that right. other sound and stuff. So it's all about hands. And then so he doesn't use pedals to get extra sustain. He doesn't need it. So he'll use his palms and his fingers to get the squeals and all that stuff is all done by hand. Yeah, and so great. how old school is that? It's, it's brilliant. And brilliant. And uh, he was in that. Yeah. So after the dictators, he was in a band in France called um, Shaking Street. I don't know if you know them. No, not really. But they, oh my God, they, they, they are just unbelievable, Steve. They have a female lead singer. She's um, Algerian, French, and and beautiful voice. And on their second album, which Ross played on, you can you know his lead guitar. It's it's dirty and powerful and off the hook and just blisters out of the speakers. But it's melodic, yeah. and that guitar playing on top of a band that it, 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 okay. The closest thing I would say is imagine Blondie's Parallel Lines, but with Ross the Boss <laughs> um, pushing Chris Stein out of the room, going. <laughs> Get out of the room. <laughs> I'm doing some, the lead. We've got some and filthy New York guitar sludge coming. Unbelievable. <laughs> uh, it's seriously unbelievable, Steve. Uh, it's a great record. As uh, uh, all those Man of War records that he did, no, unbelievable. Oh, sport, even, the, even, the, even the first one where um, people are a bit upset about the production and everything, but just like, you know, you know, Eric's um, screaming and stuff. It's like, oh, my God, where did this come from? Do you, know, do you know what's funny when they say upset about the production? But they've remastered that. I was looking at it at YouTube the other day. But I, I go straight yeah. to the remaster and go, what's it like? And then I go, nut nah, And I go back to the original. I want that one. I'm the want, same. That, and and yeah. that first record is like, is like funny you were talking about uh, uh, the, your your pop punk A side A and uh, thrash metal side B of your hard ons record. That first Man of War record is like that. The first side is like four kind of normal, you know, it's got Man of War, those songs, Fast Taker, yeah, Shell Shock, yeah. and then the yeah, other yeah. side's got Battle Hymns and, and oh, you know, it's yeah, it's all now, now it's yeah. epic Man of War. Slaughter Lord, early before yeah. called Slaughter Lord, we used to do Battle Hymns as a cover oh, in the, the mountains. Yeah. In oh, my God. I bet there was no other band in Australia, or especially in the Blue Mountains. I could only play drums. I just wanted to do that massive drum roll. <laughs> <laughs> the word the, yeah. the, the guitar set on, on the piano seat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the word epic doesn't quite cover it, you know. Oh, mate. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I actually really like side one more. Uh, oh. I love that song, um, uh, Shell Shock. I mean, the lyrics, you know, the, yeah, the, oh, like, you know, the bullets come free. <laughs> you know? yeah. I just, the, the lyrics are just so it, clever. There you ain't know? no charge I, for the haircut. Haircut, yeah, the bullets come free. <laughs> and the bullets come free. Do you want to know what's so great? The guy, here we go. This is classic. The guy, Glenn Kirkpatrick, who you probably know, who drew yeah, the, of course. Of course, who drew the, who drew the Slaughter Lord Dace to Blood demo cover. Right? How did I meet that guy? I'll tell you. I knew his sister because she was going out with a guy who was in the theatre group that my father was in. 
So I went up there and I, I, his, his mother had moved him up to the Blue Mountains because he lived in, Ash, uh, in Auburn and he used to get up to a bit too much mischief, right, with the yobbos, right, with robbing things and driving cars and drinking booze, right? So he bring him up here. He's, he's, he's now got the garage as a bedroom. We met him and he was a bit sort of standoffish. We were just, you know, he's about three years older than us and we were just like 15 and that. And we met him. He's, he's, from, the, he's from the suburbs. And we're just these mountain kids. And then we found out he was an artist, you know, an, an animator. So I took that first Man of War record up to him and I was just like, oh, do you reckon you could, uh, do you reckon you could draw this for me? You know, I can make a back patch or something like this. And he went, oh, you know, just, just leave it here and I'll see what I can do, you know. And then I go back a week later and he's like, I oh, like, have you done it? He goes, no, I haven't done it, but I've been listening to this record all week. He goes, do you have more? He goes, I love it. <laughs> I went, yeah. And then I just, then we became best mates and I just took all my metal records up to his garage. We just sat there every weekend, drunk, drunk booze or listen to metal. <laughs> so that, there you go. That's fantastic. That's, yeah. yeah. Matt Moore gets, gets normal suburban yobbos into metal. <laughs> So let's uh well we'll be going an hour and a bit better. let's let's talk more hard odds. You've you've yeah, you've just got what's your last record you had out? And you told me the other day you're doing another one. Another one soon? Yeah. So we put out a yeah, we put out an album last year called Ripper Twenty Three. I love um, that. I loved I love that, that because was, I remember, I remember uh, those covers, remember those covers with the chicks with the chicks uh jeans cut out? Have you got one? Yeah. I think so. You got some Pokemon there. Uh, let's see. I, I, yeah, I haven't got it, Steve. I gave it away. I, oh. I, think I gave it to a homeless guy. <laughs> you know, can you, can you, can you wait till like I might have one in the lounge room? Can you wait? Yeah, yeah. Oh, hang on. <laughs> Put up a test pattern. Da, da. We'll be back right after this break, folks. In the meantime, why not go to the kitchen, make yourself a cup of tea, perhaps grab yourself a biscuit. No sugar, though. Oh, here we go. Our program will resume immediately. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and whose succulent buttock is that? Well, it's the only person in the hard-ons without tattoos all over his ass. That's, that'll be our least singer, Tim. <laughs> it couldn't be my ass. Uh, yeah. <laughs> my ass has got swastikas all over it. <laughs> and I'll get cancelled. Yeah, yeah. Couldn't no, be mine. I don't, couldn't be mine. I don't have one. It'll just have the denim. They'd be like, what's, what's in there? <laughs> but I have to tell you. But my swastikas are, are reversed because I I was raised as a Buddhist and uh, it, yeah. it's not a symbol of fascism at all. They're, oh, they're, know, they're symbols know. of um, eternity, you know. So it's it's actually the 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 Nazi swastika reversed. And um, well, it's a sun uh, symbol. Well, we, and it represents my family used rep to have it when when yeah. uh, when I was young. Yeah, and it also represents the four seasons. You know, different things it goes around. It's reversed as a sun symbol. Yeah, yeah. But someone, someone got up to mischief yeah. and so, inverted it. As soon as they invert things, everyone gets up to mischief. <laughs> yeah. Oh, look, I, I just, um, I, I, I just, uh, I, I just, um, uh, t t tell my mum, look, um, don't put any of the Buddha symbols up, mum, because, um, you know, some yeah. of my friends are Jewish and they might take it the wrong way. They're having a hard <laughs> time dealing with stuff. Yeah. Like my friend Rob, you know, he's, he's He's Jewish, so he's circumcised, you know, so his cock looks like a Nazi helmet, so he's still at that. <laughs> anyway, back to that. <laughs> so that's the last Hard Odds album, and you're doing, and did Lachlan do that one? Yes, he did. He did the last three. And, oh, um, right. okay. Yeah, so he did the last three. He did the last four out of the last five, so we've... We've used Lachlan for a long time. He's so yeah. He, you know what he sounds like. You know he, he does know his way around a, Mate, a recording console. Do you want to hear a tragic story? I tell you the tragic story. We met Lachlan because he saw Presto and he goes. He came up and he introduced himself and said, "I love you." This is how I got into Nazul. He goes, I, "He goes, I love your band. Would you like to come into three hundred one night?" Because he was working there you know, from midnight to dawn because you had know, free time. You can do what you want. Went yeah. So we used to go in there with Presto. Then he goes, you, you know, we need a drummer for Nazul. Can you come in and 
do, you know, do the first Nazul demo. I remember playing at Springfields with Presto, drove all the way to Strathfield, dumped my kit, drove back into 301. I got there at four in the morning and did the first Nazul song ever. Hadn't played blast beats for years. So I just put, hadn't even heard the song. They just put the headphones on me. They just went, play fast. I just went, right. <laughs> right. And then here's the, here's the, this is the point I'm getting at. So basically he became what? An, a, a, an award-winning uh, 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 sound engineer throughout Australia. He's done some of the big alternative records throughout Australia. When we were doing the first Presto record, not the first one, not that one, but the second one, we wanted him. But because we got a record deal by then, they went, no, we don't know who this guy is. And so we're going to get this guy and we want this guy from the Angels to produce it and do this and do that. And you know, who's this guy? And I'm like, and, and the production of that record just is shit and drives me insane. And I can't, and it was a great record with killer songs. And I listened to the production. And I just go, well, why, 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 why did we back down? Our band was kind of falling apart then, but, oh. but why didn't we just go, no, you have to get this guy. He would have turned it into a, the record it was supposed to be. It's, it's, yeah. Sometimes I put that record on and I just go, why? And I was talking to Lachlan the other day. I'm like, oh, the snare yeah. sounds so shit. And he goes, it's that sans amp. I went, that's it. <laughs> He's like, if I had done it, I know. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Lachlan <laughs> always knows. He's he's so talented, you know. He, oh, no. he does yeah, he 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 knows what things need and he, he's very good at problem solving too. Anytime oh. there's something happening, he says, We'll do it this way, we'll figure it out. And he always comes up with good solutions. He's really he's always, good. He's always comes up with a solution. I remember ringing him one day and I go and he could keep his calm. He's like my producer we've got on this show. I, he, sometimes he goes, What's going on? But I know just in about thirty seconds ago, ah. That's what's going on. And then I go, ah, oh, yeah, so. yeah. I know he knows. Lock on's like that. I was talking to him one day on the phone and I go, how are you? He goes, oh, I'm a little, uh, a little upset at the moment. I went, why is that? He goes, I've just finished recording this band and I seem to have the hard drive of the entire album seems to have crashed. And I'm like, the whole album? He's like, yeah. Yeah, I don't know what I'm going to do about this. <laughs> he was still calm. I went, I'm going to have to go and find someone, see if they can dig it out of this busted up computer or hard drive. And that, yeah, that's a, it's a bit of an inconvenience. <laughs> it's got a whole band's album. Just, I rang him a couple of days later. Did you get it back? Yeah, I got it back. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course he did. He's just, I asked him to come on the podcast. He's so humble. He goes, why? Well, because you're the biggest. Award-winning <laughs> underground guy that's been in Nazul and 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 you recorded so many bands. You've done hard on records. You've done all these award-winning bands in Australia. Why would I come on? Because you're the best engineer around. <laughs> so hopefully, hopefully he'll come on. You know, but he's such a humble guy. So you know, and great guy. He, he really is. He's, Lachlan really is a good guy, and he, he doesn't have any hubris about him at all. He's mm -hmm. um because he's so humble, and I think that's why he's good. He doesn't um you know, um, believe in his own hype or anything. So he's always um, about the band, not about him. <laughs> and that's what uh, you want in an engineer, you know. Mate, I, uh, he was always the guy who had leads around his neck. Like he had, he had these studio leads around his neck. And then he had that big desk. He, you know, we were in 301 and that. And I used to stare at him, what does this, all, all this do? And then something would go wrong and then he'd just, just stay calm and then fiddle around with things and then beep. Oh, good. Uh, yeah, it's fixed. Uh, like, yeah, whew, yeah. Thank God this guy's yeah. here. So he's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he gets great sounds, you know. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And so he's doing your new record. When, when are you doing that? Uh, we're doing it in the first week of May and then we have a week off. Uh, and then we have the second week of May. So we're thinking that the first week of May, we've got two days booked. We're going to do all the backing tracks, uh, i.e. drums, rhythm guitar, and bass in the one hit. And then, and so we, we, we've got two days for that. I know it sounds like not much, but um, we do a lot of pre-production before we go in, Steve. So yeah, yeah, before yeah. we even, before we even give Lachlan the demos, we would have already like, you know, uh, hammered them into shape in our own rehearsal studio is just knocking and things into shape and throwing out all the wrong ideas and just keeping the good ones. And then so that by the time we go into the studio and Lachlan says recording, 
we're going to do maybe one, two, or third take, and then it'll be done. And then, I mean, the songs go for, like, three minutes each. We've got, like, 12 songs or something. It shouldn't take any more than uh, two uh, working days. Uh, so we think that's enough. And then the second week, um, after a week's break, uh, we do all the um, uh, instrumental bits, um, uh, like the lead guitar, I mean, uh, piano, any piano bits that need to go in, any um, lead guitar, uh, and vocals, of course, and all the harmony vocals. There'll be a lot of singing uh, as well. So um, with Tim in the band, our new singer, because he's so good vocally, uh, we, we do a lot of vocal arrangements. So um, and we make them, we make him sing things over and over again, like harmonized and uh, yeah. So um, it should go pretty quickly. Um, uh, Lachlan um, knows that we'll come prepared, so it'll 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 go pretty quickly. Steve, what what band was Tim in again? Uh, he's in a band called You and I right yeah, now. Yeah, that's right. It was You and I. Yeah, he was always yeah. in You and I. Yeah, that's the band that he forms. Yeah, um, I always used to get them yeah. mixed up with the Whitlams. I go, which one was which one was? That's right, You and I. Yeah, yeah, he's he's um. Well, they were they were, big, they, they were big around Presto time. They were big around the nineties. They, they were you know when Presto were playing and stuff. They were they were always around. I think their second and third album went uh, triple platinum, which is yeah, right. <laughs> considerate. Yeah, seventy thousand copies each in Australia, or even more. I think. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, they 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 got um, they got the due. Um, but I have to tell you, I mean, you know, he, people like. People like that come from a different world to us. I mean, I, I come from a punk background, and you come from a metal background. And uh, Tim, he loves metal and punk, but he also is from uh, a more of a um, uh, indie rock background, and that's a that's another scene altogether, you know. Yeah, yeah, totally. And, uh, yeah, and he he had that. Um, he he basically, you know, sometimes when you think, how did bands get that big? It's because they're saying something to a lot of people, and and those a lot of people are actually listening and they, they um, relate to it. And because, you know, I, I talk to Blackie about this all the time. Blackie goes, how come that band's really big and we're not? And I go, well, we just don't know how to talk to a lot of people at the same time. We just don't, you know. It's not saying that what we're saying is um, invalid. I'm just saying um, we just yeah. don't know to say the things that would – interest a lot of people but it doesn't mean that it's bad you know there's some kind of honor in that as well <laughs> oh yeah i tell you what you know my comedy is like that you know as my oh, buddy no, as, as, as my buddy in england calls me he goes you're the best known least known comedian around <laughs> yeah but you know i i, I i've been to a, a lot of your shows and they're always packed and um i'd never laughed so much in my life and i mean you, they can't take that away from you, jeez. No, 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 no. It gets, but it's you know, it's still to a, it's still to a degree. If it, like you know, whether or not you want to hear comedy about, I don't just do, you know, I don't just do comedy about, you know, how come your girlfriend's got so many shoes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you know, that can, that can appeal to a lot of people. You know. Yeah. Anyway, I think we're going to wrap it up. Oh, this Steve, is, this has been too much fun, and uh, maybe in a couple of weeks, a couple of a month, or two couple of months, you could even come back because. See, I have so much fun talking to people about music that I, that know the music that I, that we both relate to. So, if you ever want to come back on, we can talk about metal and stuff again. You know, it's always fun. So, I'd love to. I'd love to oh, do it. Look, Steve, they're my people. You know, they really are. I mean, you know, I can talk to you about music all day, every day. And I mean, <laughs> I, I'm just lucky I work in a record store. Yeah. I don't let people leave, Steve. They buy a record and I like it. I go, you're not going anywhere. I want to talk about this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a friend of but mine, I... a friend of mine, Dominic, he's a, good, he's, a, he's a nurse actually, and he lives in Redfern and he's a great guitarist. He did some solos on my, on my, uh, my uh, solo album, the Eternum record. And uh, he just, I was at his house about two weeks ago and just, oh, I didn't want to leave because he was just, he just taught you start talking about a record. You know, he knows the producer, he knows this, oh, the way they do this, the way they could sub it, and you're just like, oh, here we go, this is going to be great, <laughs> you know? Yeah. You know? Oh, that, that's, yeah, that's what gives our lives meaning, I think. I mean, um, I actually don't need religion. I mean, I know a lot of people are religious and, and that they have meaning in life through religion, but I think 
we made our own meaning through art and culture, you know, and uh, look, I, it's just as important to me then, uh, you know, uh, music is just as important to me as God would be to a religious person, put it that yeah. way. You know? Yeah. You know? Well, that's a profound, uh, that's a profound thing to say as we end. I think this has been absolutely excellent. I hope you've enjoyed it folks. And uh, thanks Ray. Thanks Ray. For oh, thanks on. Steve. No uh, it's been an absolute uh, uh pleasure and uh, honor talking to you steve and and i'm i'm glad we're after all these years we're still friends yeah. i'm really glad yeah. same here and i'll see you in utopia soon discount <laughs> <laughs> bang we're out of here okay <laughs>